All right. Darn, I so wish that had gone in. I love it when students throw things in the classroom. All right. Today, we're going to continue our, uh, our look at the fact that the materials in, in real life, and certainly the way we study them in this class, deflect the fact that, that all these beams we've been looking at, however they might be supported, however they might be loaded, all kinds of things we've looked at as possibilities in this class. All of these type of things can cause beams to deflect in some way. Um, you know, this kind of load, let's see, with those three supports, uh, certainly the beam can't go down at those points, but in between it can do all kinds of things. So it probably do something like this. I don't know what it would do under that kind of load. Of course, greatly exaggerated. And we, uh, we can have other types of loads of various kinds. And there'll be other deflections caused by these other types of beams. Certain things we just know. Uh, for example, uh, of course the beam can't go lower than this and it can't go lower than that. And because it's embedded in the wall, it's going to have uh, no angle to it at the wall. So maybe this one will deflect something like that. We figure, again, greatly exaggerated. But that's, that's just sort of our, our common sense take on this. And that's not good enough. So what we need is some kind of uh, some kind of way to actually calculate what this deflection is. So we'll use the little symbol V. I'm not sure exactly why, but that will do as good as anything. Uh, deflection from some uh, some neutral unloaded. State, which of course is just simply straight. We want to figure out just what those deflection curves are as a function of x. Certainly it has to do with x because of x, as we go along the uh, axial direction of the beam, there's the load changes with X, there's uh, supports at X, all of these type of things we have to figure out. So as we go through this, we're going to come up with five equations. So we're going to keep track of our equations as we, as we accumulate the five of them. And uh, uh, we may need all five for certain problems. We may need just, uh, well, we might need just one of them because here's our first deflection equation. We might just know what the deflection curve is. Sometimes in, uh, in uh, certain classes, you know, certain, certain types of problems like these, you just already know what you've got somehow. Um, I don't know exactly how that would take form, but uh, I, I, get, I guess if we had a beam that was supported <coughs> everywhere along it. That we had a beam that was laying on the earth. No matter how we load that beam, it's not going to deflect. Then we know the deflection curve for that problem. So I don't know, something like that I guess we could do. Uh, but it's a possibility, so we have to have it up there. Plus, uh, as we're going to find, these five equations are very closely related to each other. and the end product that we want anyway is we do want to get back to this load curve, I mean this deflection curve. That's our ultimate goal. So that's, that's our first equation there. All right, so, so let's, uh, let's start to put this together. We have, uh, we have some, well, let's see. Now let me draw in a more 
regular way because uh, it doesn't really matter what we've got going here. We've got we've got uh, some position x, some deflection at that point where uh, we're going to zoom in and look at some piece of the beam that's deflected. So this is this is nothing more than a, a picture of us taking a zoomed in look here someplace, one of these spots. And we, we just have to, we have to narrow in on it to, to really figure out what's going on. So that's a, the kind of thing we've got right now. So uh, there'll be, of course, along here, a neutral axis. And with respect to that neutral axis, the beam has some curvature at that point. And we before have called that radius and curvature rho, so we'll continue with that for now. And at that point, we'll know something about the slope of the beam. That kind of thing being, let's see. Um, the slope, well that's the, if, if the neutral axis is taking the shape of this load curve, then the slope is the derivative of that with respect to x. And of course, that's also the tangent of whatever angle that, uh, that the, the beam is happening to make there. It's curved, it's loaded, it's got some slope to it there, so that's all we're looking at is that little piece right there. Uh, except for the fact that these are very small deflections we're talking about. Small, actually not small. We're talking about the angle here. So from very small angles to that slope. Remember, all these are absurdly uh, exaggerated drawings. What we're really talking about is is not even millimeters of deflection, maybe tenths of millimeters of deflection over the span of a of a uh, you know a twenty foot beam or something. Very very small deflections. So when that's the case, then tangent theta is approximately equal to theta for very very small deflections. So we'll take that. And then that gives us our second load curve, which is that now we have a way to relate the first derivative of the load curve. So we've taken a step one beyond. So now our uh, second equation is that one. So we're already making pretty good progress. Uh, we're looking for that low curve. If we know how the slope changes with x, then we could just integrate that and we'd have our load curve. We'd be all set and we could start, start uh, continuing whatever the design is that we're trying to do for that load curve. All right, so, so we're already making some progress. How many equations did I say we we're gonna come up with? Five? We've got two of them done, and geez, we're going to be out of here by, uh, by about 24 past. We're just going to be flying. Doobie's going to be sorry she missed this class because we're, we're just working so well. Uh, hi, Dave, Doobie. Hey, everybody. So, we have to call him. Send her an Easter card. All right. So we're doing, we're making great progress. Let's see what's the next one. Oh, this one, this one uh, you'll have to pull out of uh, uh, your calculus book, um, which in other words means there's no possible way we could remember this, even though it might look vaguely familiar when we get to it. Uh, so this one is has to do with the curvature of some curve itself. Looks something like this. See if it uh, see if it doesn't look familiar.
the second derivative of this load curve is related to something like this. I'm, I'm sure that most of you have already written it down because it just pops from the memory. Look familiar? Okay. Oh, no. But it does certainly look like the type of thing you would have done uh, for a, a week or two in calculus, shaking your head and go, why do we do this kind of stuff? Well, here's, here's why we did it. Here's one of the things it leads to. Um, but the deal for us here that we need is remember, let's see, that's, that's the thing we just came up with. That's the angle the curve is making at any point. Uh, which is very small. So if this is very small, what's the square of very small? Very smaller. So this is, this is for uh, our purposes, zero, which means the bottom is one to the three halves, which is one. So uh, we have that this is essentially the second derivative of our load curve, which you might think is our third equation because we've gone from the curve to the first derivative to the second derivative, but not quite. Because remember, this curvature business itself is not an easy thing for us to know. It's also not an easy thing for us to use. So we've got to do something else with that that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that'll be a little bit more useful because that's just not all that useful. Um, but we have dealt with that kind of thing before. Let's uh, let's see if we can relate it to this drawing some. Um, actually, I think I'll just clean it up because we don't need the angle on here right now. So I'm going to just clean up that very same drawing. We've got this this segment of the beam with some heavily exaggerated curvature to it, some neutral axis along there, and the radius of curvature down with respect to the neutral axis because uh, there's a slightly different curve at the top here and a slightly different curve at the bottom. So we relate it to the neutral axis because remember, that's our, our point of no stress. All right, so we've got, uh, let's see, we've got this, this uh, whole business subtends some angle delta theta, which is, which is very small. And remember, we measure y from the neutral axis. So let's see. Uh, a distance, uh, let's see, down to some point here. That's y up from the neutral axis. From the center of curvature, that itself is a distance rho minus y then. And if this portion of the beam had a length of delta x, that line will have a length we'll call delta x prime. Because it's, it's uh, remember, above the neutral axis for this type of bending, we have compression. Below the neutral axis, we have uh, tension. And uh, I think the only other piece we need, do we need it now? We don't really need it, so I'll leave it out. All right, we actually, we, we've done this type of thing. This is, this is a familiar step from, uh, from, geez, I don't know, uh, maybe the third week or something we did this. Because we can now write down what the strain is, which remember is the, the uh, a deflected length uh, 
a, a de amount of deflection, amount of contraction or extension divided by the original length. So the amount of um, relative uh, compression we have here is delta x minus delta x prime. Do I want them in that order? No, delta x prime. Yeah, we want the new length minus the old length. Yeah, that will give us a negative over the original length. Remember, this is just from our definition of strain from a, a long time ago. Right, that was right about third week or something, wasn't it? Remember it's back how young you were back then, how fresh faced and eager you were back then. Now you're now you're you're jaundiced and biased and bitter and tired. Alright. So uh, we have done this very thing. Let's see. That delta x prime, well that's actually the arc length at the radius r minus y. So the radius times the angle, r minus y del theta, that's delta x prime. Right? That's just that's just a, a, a way to do arc length. Delta x is the same kind of thing, only the radius down to there is rho, the radius of curvature, so this is rho delta theta. And then that's the same thing on the bottom. Which is nice because the del thetas cancel. We get rho minus rho over, oh wait, forgot something here. What do we need here? Uh, we need a rho on the bottom there, rho del theta. So on the top we have rho minus rho, so we're left with just minus y over rho. If you remember exactly the same thing we got three weeks ago. But we're almost set now to tie this all together and we'll have our third equation momentarily. So we've got this this uh, this strain now. Remember to the definition of Young's modulus. Remember that? What is it? Yeah, but the, it cancels. Talking about it's S over A because it cancels. So that means that that strain we can put in there. We get our normal stress which is Young's modulus, a characteristic of the material, times whatever strain we're seeing here. But we know that strain to now be minus y over rho. Except, in the last few weeks, we've come up with something else for the normal strain. Remember, we got to all this business, all we were talking about was simple axial loading that caused our normal stresses. Now we're talking about bending that causes our normal stresses. We developed that uh, about a month ago. So we know that this also equals minus my over i. Which means, of course, then these two things are equal to each other. So let's see uh, if we can put that all together now. Let's see. Um, oh, we can do something more with this top one. Minus E Y, minus E Y times 1 over rho. But 1 over rho is 
the second derivative of the load curve. So if we put those all together, let's see. Um, the, the, well, let's, let's write it up here so we don't make a mistake. Uh, the two minus signs cancel, so I'm done with those. EY, D squared, B, D X squared. The second derivative of our load curve, which is kind of what you might expect. We went from the curve to the first derivative, now we're at the second derivative. Equals MY over I. Y cancels, that's good. So we've got, we're gonna be able to find out the beam deflection without worrying about just where we are in the beam. Uh, it's gonna be the same for the entire beam. That kind of makes sense, it all goes together. And we'll rearrange things a little bit just to make them uh, uh, in a way that's useful. Um, And we get that, and there's our third equation. Which is nice since the moment itself, remember, is a function of x. And we've, we've been figuring, we started figuring that business out, what the moment is uh, with position on the beam for, uh, since back in, um, Statics, we did that. So the the uh, moment is related to the second derivative of the beam. B of the oops, I don't know. That's that's supposed to be in yellow. I don't know why it turned to pink. That's terrible. So if you wrote it down in pink, erase it, please, and put it in yellow. So we, uh, we have no trouble figuring out the moment with function of, uh, as a function of x. We've been doing that for, for months, since last fall we've been doing that. So if we can figure out the moment curve, we know it's related to the second derivative of the uh, curvature, the, uh, the deflection of the beam, the beam curve, and we can integrate back and get the, uh, the beam curve now. I like these new colors. That's an awful pretty board. If you guys want to take a second and take a picture with your cell phones or something. Hey Pat, you got your coffee mug there? Did you know there's free coffee at Starbucks if you bring in your own mug for Earth Day? Uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Wish, wish you'd known that, huh, Brandon? Man, you paid for that, didn't you? Sucker. All right, all you have to do is be able to handle stomach going into Starbucks. So. All right, so uh, third equation there. This is going great. Everybody okay? Bobby, what's the matter? You're not going, you're, you wish you'd gotten free coffee. You didn't know that. Three curves there, all of them leading back to the shape of the beam itself when loaded. Now, the, the leftover part is, is very easy. The next two equations, uh, if you think about it for a second, you come up with them. The next two equations are, remember that uh, moment is related to shear, the slope of the... Got it backwards. I always do. It's easy when I've got the diagrams there. The shear gives us the slope of the moment curve. That's what I want. Yeah, that looks better, doesn't it? The 
the shear is the slope of the moment curve. Dm dx. Well, we've got m right there. So this is d dx of e i d squared v dx squared. The reason we put e i over there, there's two reasons to put e i over there. One is that has nothing to do with the load. That's uh, E, remember, is the material characteristic. I is the cross-section characteristic. Has nothing to do with the load. Also has to do with the fact that when we've done these problems, we've come up with the moment function. Uh, the moment is a function of X all by itself. We didn't come up with the moment divided by EI. So it's just a little more straightforward there. So then this equals EI, which of course is constant. And we get that the shear is equal, is proportional to the third derivative of the beam curve. And that's our fourth equation. Which is good because we know how to come up with the shear as a function of x as well. Uh, that might even be a little bit easier than coming up with the moment as a function of x. So if we have the shear as a function of x, we've got the third derivative of the beam curve, we can integrate back to the beam curve itself. One more equation, five equations. And we have a feeling where it's coming from? The fourth derivative. Well, yeah, that's, that's a good guess. That's going to be in there. I would certainly follow. But where do we get the uh, equation to do that? What? This? Yeah. Yeah, it's, no, it's Q. Third derivative. Second derivative, first derivative, zero derivative. Oh, there. I don't know what you're talking about. Looks perfect to me. All right. What's the next step? Got an idea? DB we had, huh? DB with respect to X. Well, we have, remember we did our shear moment diagrams. We had moment was related to the shear. The shear was related to the what? Position. No. When we were doing our shear moment diagrams, we had one that related the slope of the shear curve. Oh, you're going to hate yourselves when you're going to say, oh man, I knew that. The load curve. Whatever the load curve happens to be. Often it's zero because uh, we are using point loads. Sometimes the distributed load curve is constant. Sometimes it's linear. We can handle anything. Uh, but the load curve itself is a function of x. And we get then the fourth derivative. And so there are our five equations. And oh, I said it was going to happen at 24 past. It took us a little longer. Oh, we, were, we stopped and talked about coffee. And there we go, we've got the five, five curves that uh, relate all of these things for us. And so we're ready to apply it. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to do one of the easiest examples we've got. It's right in the book. 
anyway, but this way you don't have to sit and go through that one. You don't have to take notes for this because it's in the book. You can just sit and pay attention to it because it's nothing more really than uh, several steps of integration of uh, simple polynomials. So we'll, uh, we'll do that one together. We'll take the case of a simply support a cantilever beam with a point load at the end. About as easy uh, a one as we can get so we can, we can take our first cut through this. All right, for simplicity's sake, we'll take x from the end. We don't have to, we could do x from the wall, but if we take x from the load, then the moment itself becomes a little bit easier. The moment is then just minus px at any place. Uh, which makes sense, remember, there's, there's no moment at the end since it's a free end, and then the moment increases with distance because of uh, because of that load at some point p. We know that the shear must be equal to p there. Then we have a moment, uh, a couple there that we need to counteract. And that couple must be the same size as the the moment must be the same size as the couple, which is p times x, but that's a minus direction, so it's minus px. So uh, about as simple as we can get for a, a moment function there. Um, if we take x measured from the free end, it just becomes simpler. But it doesn't matter. We could have done it from the other way. We're just uh, not real fond of hard work if we can avoid it. All right, so that puts us in right here at the third equation. We now know that the moment is equal to minus px is equal to ei. I know you're all tempted to say ei, eio. And you can if you want. If you want to sing that out at any time. Jake, you're not in the mood? No? All right, puts us in right there. We're at d squared v dx squared. So we can integrate that. That will take us back one step to here. So uh, um, we'll, let's see, we'll integrate that. Let's see the, uh, the integral. We get minus px. But then we integrate that once. We get minus px squared over 2. Is that right? For integrating that moment. But this is an indefinite integral. So we have a, 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 a constant of integration in there. This now is, is theta. A little piece there. Uh, oh, we've got an EI in there. That should do it. Let's make sure I got the pieces. Yeah, EI. Okay, we're all right. This, this is the part we're concerned with, so we can take the next step in the integration. Uh, however, to evaluate this constant of integration, remember how to get rid of those? Use boundary conditions. If you know some boundary condition that applies to the equation, then you can eliminate the constant of integration. We know that at sorry at x equals l, the full length of the beam, theta equals zero. 
We know that because it's a cantilever support. It's an embedded support. So that's our boundary condition. Let's see, if x equals l, then we have minus p l squared over 2 plus c1 equals 0. Because theta is 0 at x equals l. So c1 equals p l squared over 2. Fair enough. With that one, that work out okay? I think we got all the minus signs. Okay, so now we're at uh, let's see. Now we're at e i d v d x. This is minus p. x squared over 2 plus whatever c was, which is pl squared over 2. And we can clean that up a little bit if we need to. But not, too, not too difficult, just a polynomial. We'll integrate it once again, which will then give us our deflection curve. So minus P X. We're integrating this first term cube over there's already a two there, so six plus remember PL squared over two is a constant, so that integrates to X. And then, oh, uh, another constant of integration, and that equals uh, EI times the load curve. Is that okay? Yeah, because we integrated this side integrated that side, got us down just to v as a function of x. How do we get rid of that constant of integration then? What boundary condition can we use for it? x equals l v equals 0. At x equals l, at the wall, the deflection is 0. Because that's a, a straight support. So at x equals L, V equals zero. So we put that in minus P L cubed over six plus P L and then another L. So this is P L cubed over two plus the constant we're trying to solve for equals zero. So C2 equals plus PL cubed over 6 minus PL cubed over 2. Got all the minus signs all right. Yeah. <coughs> And so now we can put everything back together. We get the load curve. So it's going to be L squared. Where? Here? Yeah, no, PL it was PL squared oh. and then X equals L right. for our boundary condition. So it come up, becomes PL cubed. So of course then that, can, that cleans up to what? Uh, minus PL cubed over three, I think. All right. And so now we can put all this back together um, into our load curve 
and we get then for the load curve and a final form. So we'll know just how much deflection with X. We, we know the beam's going to do something like this. But now we'll be able to, to draw it um, precisely. So put all the pieces back together. I'll clean it up a little bit for you. <coughs> we get minus P over 6 EI. Remember that term EI is, is uh, not load dependent. Minus x cubed plus 3L squared x minus 2L cubed. And notice, of course, the units work out. All these terms, all three of these terms is meters cubed. And with everything else we've got over here, then we end up with uh, uh, units of just meters. And we're done. Jake? Um, Jake, I said we're done. Our bounds, um, are they always going to be the same for every problem that we do? For no, because uh, we might not have a cantilevered beam. If we have a simply supported beam, <laughs> like this, under some kind of load that causes it to reflect, we don't know what the angle is going to be at those. We do know that the deflection will be zero here, but we don't know what the angle is going to be in any one of those. We might not know anything else. Um, however, the boundary conditions are in table 12.1 in your book. So, um, does anybody have a book or should I just put it up on the screen? I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. Page 576 if you do have your book. If you don't, hang on a second and I'll put it up. And any book is going to have these, any of these, these uh, strength and material books are going to have it. So these are the boundary conditions you can apply for any one of the problems. A roller support or a simple pin support have the same boundary conditions. No deflection at that point, that's what supports do. But they also can't support any moment. So if you have a, a problem where you start with the shear curve, integrate back to the moment curve, and get a constant integration there, then you can use the boundary condition at a pin or a roller that there's no moment supported. Uh, that's pin, a roller at the end. The third one is a roller in the middle. There could be moment there because there could be bending in the beam there, but you know there's going to be no deflection. Same thing with a pin in the middle. We just use this cantilevered beam. The, the two boundary conditions that come with it, we just use both of those. A free end. Uh, we've been using those boundary conditions when we do the shear moment diagrams. The fact that at a free end, there's going to be no shear and no moment, but there's certainly going to be some angle. Don't know what though. And then we don't see it very often, but uh, we could have two, bin, two beams hinged in the middle. We know at that point the moment is zero because of the, the hinge. So those, those are available for you. Um, page 576, table 12.1. Okay, so uh, also, I probably should have left that up, uh, also available to us since we're, uh, we're not lazy, we're efficient. 
for some simple loads, all of these integrations are already done with applied uh, boundary conditions for simple loads. Now, we may not have that particular, any one of these particular loads in any one of our problems, so we've got to do it, but if the load we're looking for is in here, uh, then we don't need to do the integration. And you can see the one we just did is, uh, is right in there, cantilever beam with a load right at the end. It's, it's not in the exact same form I have it in. They factor out uh, some of the terms, some of the common terms, uh, to get it down to a slightly different form. But in general, it's the very same uh, solution we just made. So we didn't need to do it. We could have just looked it up. Just be careful applying any of these. Make sure that your orientation is at the same place that some of the, any of the intermediate values you might need to use, the deflection is in exactly the same direction or position or, um, for example, look at the second one if you can. I'll put it back up. Because nobody's got it. Well, Jake does, a couple other Bob does. My favorite students do, Brandon does. My favorite student for how many years now, Brandon? Two. Two. So how long have you been a favorite student? You you've been a student here a lot longer than this two. All right. The the second one, uh, just as a precaution, make sure that the A and the B that places the load is the same for your problem when you go to apply it as the A and the B that's used here then in the, uh, in the particular equations. Zero to A is the longer side, so you have to make sure your beam looks like that. You may need to imagine your beam being flipped over if you've got a P that's off-center. All right, so if, if we can match those, great. We're done, we just look them up. Um, also, we can check uh, maximum deflections. We know from our problem that's going to be at x equals zero. And we can put that in, solve the problem, that makes those terms go away. We get the maximum deflection as minus uh, 2 over 6 is 3 minus P L Q over 3 E I. I think I did that right. But that's in the book anyway. That's what they've got there. And yeah, minus V max right there. Or I mean V max right there. We can also figure out what the maximum angle is by doing the same thing. Uh, back to this equation. If remember this right here itself is the angle. So we can figure out the deflection at any point. We can also figure out the maximum deflections, maximum angles, all those type of things we need. And then if we needed to, we could go up and figure out the shear and the, the load. Well, we've got the load curve, but we could figure out the shear, even though we could for this problem anyway. All right, let's start on a, another example, one of the ones that's not in the book. So that we have to just make sure we know how to go through it. Because as you can imagine, it's not often that the problems we have are going to be so nicely tabulated in the book there. So, nice simply supported beam with a uh, load curve. Distributed load, which 
is a symmetrical triangle right there to a maximum of WO at the peak and a length of the beam L. And then we want to find we want to find the load curve. First thing you do, of course, is check the tables. See if we got it there. Let's see, we've got something that's kind of close at the bottom there. We've got that, which is kind of close. Looks like uh, maybe this is just a doubling of what we have. Is that the case, though? This one has zero deflection at the light end and zero deflection at the heavy end. We don't have zero deflection at the heavy end. So we can't just take that one, double it by flipping it over and joining the two solutions together. It's not the same problem that we have there, even though it kind of looks the same. So we're going to have to do this one ourselves. A uh, couple things, let's see, what can we use? Oh, one thing we could do is we, uh, we could recognize that this problem is symmetric, so we don't need to do it across the whole beam. We only need to do it halfway. Then we can flip that solution over and join the two together. All that we have to uh, guarantee is that at the center, the, the uh, two solutions on either side meet. In other words, uh, uh, the deflection is the same for both sides. I don't know how I write that. I'm supposed to say same plus and minus mean on one side or the other of the, of the center symmetry. <coughs> also, that the uh, angle must be Yeah, not just the same on either side, the angle must be zero. Because of the symmetry, we know that it must have zero slope right there. So that can help us a little bit. We're doing a, uh, a little bit smaller problem that way. It's always nice to get a little bit smaller problem. All right. Uh, Let's see, you, you can take a, a second or two to come up with the equation for the load curve. Not too big a deal, I hope. Two omega zero over L X. All that is is uh, uh, N X plus B for this line, if we take uh, x equals zero from any one of the ends, then we get uh, just mx plus b, where that's the slope. No intercept, of course, if we take x equals zero at either end. So we're okay. So that puts us, uh, that puts us, actually that puts us to the derivative of the shear which puts us in here at the, the fifth one. Oops. So we're all excited because we have lots of integrating to do now. Right, so we can do the the first integration, uh, which will get us down to the shear as a function of x, say minus 2 omega 0 x squared over 2 plus c1. That look right? Do we have a boundary condition on the shear 
that can allow us to get rid of this constant of integration. <laughs> Boundary curves, uh, boundary conditions have to do with shear, do they? One does. Just the free end. Oh yeah, the free end one does, of course. And we don't have a free end in this problem, so we don't have a boundary condition of shear. We're just going to have to carry that through as we do the uh, the next integration. Oh, by the way, this is EI boundary. So we'll integrate it again. All oh, those tubes cancel. Oh, lost the L underneath. Sorry. So integrate it once more. Zero x cubed over L uh, over three L plus c one x plus c two. And we'll stop there. Yeah. Do we know any boundary conditions on the moment that we could use? Moment at the lower end scales. Moment at either support is zero. So if we're doing it from that direction, then uh, at x equals zero m equals zero, so we can come up with, uh, at, at least get rid of one of the, one of the uh, things. All right, so we'll finish that real quick on Monday, and then come up with uh, another method of solving these that relates all this in the same way, just uh, can make some of the problems a little bit easier.